Hello and welcome to Not That This, the pop culture talk show where I interview artists and influencers to find out their fool's gold and hidden gems, those massively popular things that they hate and those unknown or underrated masterpieces that they love. My name's Geraint Evans and I am your host. And this is the winning theme music from our competition. You had the chance to help me choose what this podcast would sound like. Thank you for voting. You, you've chosen. Uh, also, another bit of admin. This is the new regular release date for this show. From now on, it's Mondays so that I can get it done over the weekend. Of course, if you'd like me to be able to dedicate more time to this podcast, as much time as I'd like to, feel free to head over to my website, thatthispod.com, and donate to the show. In this episode, I speak to Anna Gervan. She's a theatre director and assistant director. She does a lot of work with the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company, which is a sort of area of popular culture that I don't really know about all that much. So Anna sort of walks me through what that world looks like and, and how it operates. It's, it's really interesting, but when we get into the fool's gold and hidden gem stuff, wow, this is so much fun. She taps into a, a, a pretty petty annoyance of mine and hers apparently, but we just lambast a certain kind of human. Anyway, there's no point in me telling you about it when you can hear it for yourself. Here we go. Hello, Anna. Hello. Hello, thank you for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome. No, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So you are, you're like a, you're a freelance theatre director. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so I kind of, yeah, I started directing my own work in Bristol, actually, and uh, trained as a director. And then a lot of my work, my sort of paid work, is assisting other directors okay. making their shows or, or what we call like an associate director. So you are there in the room as it's being made, have, hopefully if the director's nice, some creative input. <laughs> and then once the show is on the road or has a long run somewhere, you're the one that checks in on it and makes sure that everyone's like doing as they were told in the first place and just uh, okay. it's kind of staying true to the original uh, as, as closely as possible. So that's... Oh, right. Yeah. That's I do wonder that about sort of the touring... Theatre, yeah. like, what happens if they just fancy winging it? One night? Like, who's checking? Well, I mean, for a while, so last night, no one in my show, but um, <laughs> like, there's sort of, um, I suppose, because the people that are consistently there are the stage management thing. So, if anything right. was going totally awry, you're probably likely to get a little email just being like, so just to let you know, so and so might have done this um, tonight, and that's why the show is 10 minutes longer than normally. But, um, but no, like, generally speaking, I mean, they want to make the best show possible and if they yeah. you know have trusted the process and kind of feel proud of it then they go All right well this is this is it and this is what we want to keep with so you don't really I've fortunately never been in that situation where someone's just gone <laughs> right and, and kind of like if you're doing Shakespeare it's hardly like you can just start dropping your own words in really yeah, yeah, pe yeah. other people start noticing <laughs> um, few sort of people in the audience like oh I didn't know as to be or maybe not I'm not sure possibly you know so um yeah but I'm the one that kind of especially on tour like tours your you're going to be like different venues have different um kind of capabilities and they, they're just different shapes and sizes and auditoriums are bigger smaller and so there's a i'd be the person that's there is kind of just making sure everyone can be heard that everything works in the way it did in the original theater so yeah that's been that's quite a new experience for me actually i've normally just been in the theater we've had a run for six months and i'm just like checking in on it but this okay. time I'm working on a show at the moment called People, Places and Things, which started at the National Theatre and then it went to the West End, like did really well, so they transferred okay. it to the West End. And then the headlong, the company that created it, were like, well, we should take this out to the regions. Like people, everyone got all these five-star reviews and blah, blah, blah. Um, people deserve to see this. And so, um, and it's quite a big show technically, got lots of projection and like they've got audience that sit on stage as well as in right. the auditorium and things. So quite a feat so they they decided to tour it um but then also the so but with a totally new cast okay so the original cast have all actually now gone over to new york new york to do the show over there while we've got wow. the touring show happening over here <laughs> so yeah big ask and um and so yeah we've been spending a week we were in bath last week bristol this week 
Exeter, I've been in Manchester, going to Liverpool. So every week we're somewhere different. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, it, it throws up loads of different challenges, but it's really, it's exciting because you're kind of going somewhere that you don't really know. You don't know what the theatre scene's like there. You don't know if people are going to embrace yeah. this or not. They've not had the kind of thing of, it's been running in London for weeks and everyone's given it rave <laughs> reviews. They're just coming to it totally fresh, going like, oh, this looks good. This is on in my local, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's been... Yeah, warmly embraced so far. So that's a few, <laughs> like good. half the job done. Um, and then it's just yeah, people living away from home and things. And I think that's kind of I mean, lots yeah. of people experience that in their jobs. So it's just it's interesting. It's been like a real learning experience for me for sure. Okay, so there's there is something I want to ask you actually. Yeah. Right. So, like in on TV, mm. in movies, I know what a director does. Oh, I don't. <laughs> You're going to educate well, me. Roughly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure in theatre. Like, what right. does that look like, that job? A lot of work before... I mean, it's... Um, it kind of depends on the work you're making to an extent or what sort of director you are, but there's going to be a lot of prep work. So basically... Either you find a writer that you like the play of, or you know okay. it could be you know it could be a piece of Shakespeare, or it could be a new piece of writing. If it's a new piece of writing, you're probably going to like work on the script with them a bit. So you have like you might do workshops. They'll be writing new right. things. You get actors together. You go, well, that seems to be working. That so you, a lot of directors take on quite a like dramaturgical role as well in the creating okay. of the story. And then once that's sort of settled and hopefully you've got a producer involved or a venue that's gone, yeah, we want to <laughs> program this. This will be great. You probably then start talking to a designer about the set. Right. Then maybe even with the writer involved, like what sort of concept is, what you're wanting to achieve. Then it's like budgeting and all those things. You don't really necessarily, if you've got a great producer and venue and stuff, you hopefully think you can just leave that yeah, to them. Yeah. Um, but then and then it's the casting process, which I guess would be the same with film. You do that fairly like depends. Like it can be quite late on in the day. You might only have a month before you start rehearsals that you have, wow. you know, some of the final cast. And then you'll be in rehearsals, like, if you're lucky and you're working for the National or the Royal Shakespeare Company, well, yeah, like, between six to nine weeks it can be sometimes, depending on the company. Average is probably four weeks rehearsals, and then if you're doing stuff on the fringe, like, if you get three, you're like, (laughs) yes, wow, Um, this is crazy. So um, then in rehearsals, and it's, like, usually start and working through the text like not sort of going okay here we go up on your feet let's just do this which I think probably film and tv is more like you're kind of yeah. given the script in advance here's some sides and come back and we're going to do this scene and that scene and da 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 yeah um, but also if you forget a line or someone forgets yeah. you just stop the camera and do it again <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> no, no. to learn the covering up techniques in theatre and just style it out right. um, but yeah I mean in rehearsals obviously you can sort of stop and be like oh I screwed that or you, you have your script in hand for maybe the first couple of weeks depending on the process or right. you know actors it was interesting actually I was I can't remember who it was now it was an actor complaining about actors learning lines these days and how um you know it used to be as an actor you'd come into the rehearsals and you'd know the script already and you just get going right. whereas now it's sort of all, oh you know you shouldn't learn the script before you come in because we should discover it together otherwise you might right. learn okay. it in a way that you can't get out the habit of doing and okay and this all sort right. of older it might be Ian McKellen or someone I should do my research <laughs> but he was yeah saying you know it's true we, we go in you, you know you learn your lines and then you do it and you can still you know change and shift things within rehearsals but um but no it's kind of not the done thing these days so right. so you're sort of learning as you go and then yeah and then you kind of get to the final week start doing runs of the whole thing and hopefully everyone knows their lines and where they're meant to be stood and stuff and if they've got an accent and that and then <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you go into a technical rehearsal which could be three days or it could be I've done texts that have been two weeks because <laughs> they've wow. been really technical shows and then you have previews and so throughout the previews you'll also as a director be like maybe tweaking things maybe making massive cuts being like they did not get that joke whatsoever right, you know okay. this is not landing that's feeling too long um, and then after press night sort of in the actors and the um, assistants hands just to keep it as it was right. from there so yeah and then you're, but the thing is the director as well you've probably got that project on the go in rehearsals and you've also got your next project in your head of yeah. you know you're going to go straight into after that and it's very rare that you get to just kind of concentrate and focus all your energy on one project so how long do you stay with like um or or does one generally stay with the project as a director like is it is it for the initial run and then you you're done or yeah i mean 
sort of depends on your schedule like I suppose if once the uh, once the press night is up I'd say the majority of directors depending on how long the run is might pop in once just to double check on it but like right. once it's going I suppose it depends on you as well and how far you are in your career and how much some really check up at like read you get a show report basically every night from the stage right. manager says okay. how long it was running out how many were in the audience what the response was things that went wrong basically okay. you don't get anything that went right you get all the like <laughs> that broke that didn't work oh god and it sounds like it's a disaster and it's actually no one would have noticed um but uh yeah so you you know i'd hope that all directors will be looking at those just to check everything's kind of going all right but and then once it's you know if it's a real success it's not your it's sort of the writer's piece so if another company wants to come and pick it up or whatever it's like you know it's then becomes their show and their production this is quite okay. interesting because we've had like the original production and we've still got the original set design and it's still the director's original concept but we've had a different director actually in the rehearsal room directing it who assisted him originally and then has moved up right so i'm assisting him and it's sort of like <laughs> so it's kind of like the original, but it's also ours because it's a new cast and a new director, and which is quite unusual um, yeah. and quite different sort of pressures there to put your own stamp on it, but also stay true to something that was made a couple of years ago. Um, but they do that all the time with like The Lion King, or the you know they <laughs> yeah, they've yeah. got these huge shows that have in ten different countries at the same time, and they all got to kind of be the same, but they've all different director or. But, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, because I I think a lot because you work with the the RSC a lot, right? The Royal yeah. Shakespeare Company. Mm. Now, when it comes to like the works of Shakespeare specifically, mm. um, like why is that still happening? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a good question. It is a good question. I well, I came, so I do work with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I have been last year, uh, but before then, I'd never really done any. It was sort of my thing of I was either sort of scared of it or I also didn't right. really go and watch that much Shakespeare because of that sort of like oh, I'd just rather see a new play <laughs> yeah. um that I understand what everyone's saying <laughs> and uh, it's not five hours long um but uh so yeah I kind of went into this like why are we still doing these sort of feel like quite archaic stories and they, they were all kind of derived from Greek myths and things anyway you know their yeah. stories have been being told for thousands of years but actually, <laughs> when you're working on it, you you understand, like, like Hamlet, there's so much people relate to. He's talking about things that are actually quite big existential kind of issues about yeah, humanity yeah. And, and and morality and mortality. And, and you go, wow, he was writing this, like, 400 years ago, and it still feels really, like, relevant to today. Yeah, yeah, and even yeah. politically, like, Julius Caesar and things, and you see these these people that get to put in positions of power and become incredibly corrupt and, and like yeah. you just go, yeah, it's all, it's all going on. <laughs> like we see it all now. And you know, there was this recent production of Julius Caesar in New York and they'd basically had Julius Caesar dressed as Donald Trump and right. he, you yeah. know, they had to close it down and there was all this um, offense and, and stuff like that. And you go, wow, there's, there's, you know, there's also censorship there still. So it obviously feels like it's important. Like these people yeah. are scared by Shakespeare still and it feels like oh, could keep you know he he had to censor himself to a degree as well I'm sure when he was writing about the kings of England and yeah, yeah. the sort of political climate that was there with Elizabeth the first like he had to be careful not to like tread on his toes <laughs> he managed to do it in a way that was so kind of cocky and ballsy but also really beautiful and poetic and yeah so I think okay. I don't think um I think the problem is it feeling exclusive and people going like, I don't relate to it because it's some people in some tights and some big pantaloons and like, or all the language feels inaccessible and I'd rather just see something that's a modern day, even a modern day adaptation or something, but then you may as well just do a new play. Like, yeah. um, but I can't, my, my issue with it is that there are so many brilliant writers out there who just don't get a look in because... right. There's less risk, I suppose, to see it as putting on Shakespeare in the sense they'll be like, right, yeah. they're always Ham if Hamlet's on. People are going to go and see Hamlet, or schools will, or university people will, or um, whereas a new play that no one's ever heard of the playwright, da, 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 it's hard to sell. That's and, a big risk. And you have to pay them. You don't have to pay Shakespeare. He's dead and gone. He doesn't even have an estate they have to worry about. Like you can get one churning those out, and you're not paying. Like man, yeah, that guy. So uh, yeah, he's taken a lot of work off. New writers, which is kind of my my beef. 
<laughs> Your beef with Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm with him. I mean, I'm not sure he's got a lot to do with it these days. No, yeah, uh, no, probably didn't really care <laughs> about my beef. But yeah, I, I, I think that's probably why. And I, there is, yeah, like I quote my, my parents. Well, my dad hates Shakespeare <laughs> with a passion. And so when he had to come and see like the Shakespeare I've been working on, he was like, oh, okay. And he came and saw Hamlet and he was like, I appreciate the work you all put in, but why do they have to talk like that? And he did also say the thing of like, I didn't realise quite how philosophical it was going to be. You know, I didn't right. realise how deep that he would go into those questions. And they're all things that I've thought about life. Like what's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going too dark. But yeah, like he, uh, um, so I think he was sort of surprised by that and how much he did understand actually. But at the same time, it was like, but I just, you know, much rather watch D.L. and Pasco, to be fair. <laughs> so, you know, that's my dad's level. Um, but he, so he never really got it. And he thinks it's really elitist and it's that thing that you have to have studied it to understand it and therefore you're already cutting out a huge group of people. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, should be accessible to all. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've, I've thought about this. I, thought I might even have said it before on mm. this podcast. Like, mm. with theatre. Like, I, I, I really like theatre, but I, I, I do get that sense from most of it. Mm. of that sort of inaccessibility mm-hmm. you know like it feels like it's something for for the toffs mm-hmm. and you know I'm from a valley town in Wales so <laughs> like I've got I've got a huge problem with privilege yeah. um, <laughs> hey mate I'm from Newcastle and, uh, no I'm it's funny, like I kind of play that card, and I'm like, but I'm I'm middle class, man. I'm like, <laughs> when I there's proper Geordies in this show, and they're like, she's posh, she's from where's she from? Oh, she's a posh Geordie. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so I didn't like ask to be born there, but, you know. But it's true. I agree. Like I didn't like my parents aren't theatre people at all. Mum's a social worker. My dad's an engineer. Like I don't know. They still even are like, so how did this happen? That this was like what you wanted to do, and you can't do anything <laughs> else, and like can't you just get a proper job but I don't know I don't know why it's something about storytelling and I've always kind of loved that and like I wanted to be a writer re- like a, and actually writing for theatre I suppose specifically right, I'm not yeah. when I was at uni I thought that's what I wanted to be was go off and write scripts or short stories or something and then like this sort of directing thing kind of appeared and I was like oh that's interesting what is that I don't really know what they do oh, yeah, exactly yeah, like yeah. you like what what do they actually do um, still don't really know, um, <laughs> but well, and then I came to Bristol Old Vic and trained there. Got a master's in directing. Yeah. <laughs> Seems <a> bizarre qualification. <laughs> um, but and even then, like I left going, like I don't still don't really know, and I don't think it's kind of one formula. But um, but I still but yeah, I came from a place of being like I think there is an ins- there shouldn't be an elitism, but as soon as you move into working in the theatre, you're you become kind of part of this, like, I don't know, middle class, slightly bourgeois seeming yeah. like medium that it just shouldn't be. And it's so funny that so that's still carried around. Um, I've got a friend who actually works in, in Wales making brilliant theatre with a company called Commonwealth, who I definitely check out. And they've just made a piece of theatre in the steel mines in in. One of one of the old steel towns in South Wales. <laughs> okay. That's my research coming through, but it's like, and it's been getting loads of coverage, on the Guardian, on the BBC, and like they're a okay. company that really specialise in telling the stories of the people that voices don't normally get heard in in yeah. the sort of in the valleys, and like they've made work up in Bradford as well about Muslim boxes and like female right, Muslim, yeah, Muslim yeah. boxes, and and I just kind of like it's if we don't start telling the stories of the people like the people that are around you and you're not holding like a mirror up to society and saying like look at yourselves <laughs> like no one's no one no one's like that's not me like I don't know that so I'm not going to yeah. go see that but if you go and go oh yeah like I, 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 I know that guy I've seen that oh that's kind of me or it gives you um I'd hope like a different outlook on life will make you think differently about how you treat people or maybe make you act or like with the steelwork is it going actually why did this close down maybe politically we should have done something right, more yeah, maybe yeah. can we do something more you know I think theatre is just sort of there to that's why Shakespeare's hard it doesn't really then make people want to act and do something yeah it's to educate in a sort of different more intellectual way whereas actually I think theatre is most powerful when it's yeah, enabling people or enlightening okay. people to something yeah. that they go, hmm, maybe I can do something about this. That's my 
That's my two cents. <laughs> and I just rambled on. And I don't think there was even a question there. It was just me <laughs> fighting my corner. Um, That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know I've not had much sleep. I'm very happy for you to, <laughs> to, to ramble on. To ramble on. Uh, okay, so let's let's get into it. let's get into the stuff. Okay, shall we? sure. So, um, so Anna, what <laughs> what is your fool's gold? I found this I found this really hard. Okay. Because I always think that there's loads of stuff that really irritates me about life. I just don't understand why everyone doesn't irritate them. And then I couldn't remember any of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've kind of got two things that are really, really different, but I don't know, like... Okay. One of the things that I just don't get, and maybe it's just because I'm missing out on something, is, um, like, adults on micro-scooters and that sort of... Okay. Any sort of transport that isn't a bike or walking <laughs> I've slightly got an issue with. And I don't, and I was thinking about this and I was like, actually, maybe I've got some, maybe I've got some like elitism thing going on. Because I'm going like, actually, skateboards are okay. Somehow they seem cool. No one looks cool uh, on a mini scooter. I don't know. Skateboards, there's an age you hit. <laughs> yeah. The first, the first, I mean, like, like I've already said, I'm from a very small town <laughs> in the valleys in Wales, right? Yeah. The first week I was in Bristol, I saw a man like covered in fake tan. Yeah. But wearing a full suit. Yeah skateboarding to work yeah and I just thought you'd get punched if you did that back up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like what are you what are you playing you're at tripped over or something it's like <laughs> no 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 yeah it's that I, I guess it's I don't know it, it's tran- yeah transport I get like I cycle everywhere or walk there's never been a moment when I've gone walking is just too slow and cycling's too fast <laughs> I'm gonna get on something that I sort of push along with one foot like is it really that much quicker I mean it obviously is that bit quicker but is it to look cool and in a way I can kind of go with the skateboard thing from the 19 sort of 70s and there was that whole thing and it was kind of a cool thing and I tried it come on I tried it when I was like 14 <laughs> miserably I don't know my uh Blink-182 patches all over me and, uh, <laughs> and um, what do you call them, dungarees and shit, you know, with the little chain. But I uh, looked like an idiot and sort of gave it up then. But then, yeah, as you say, people are in suits. Like, that can't be a... F- so that's not a fashion thing. You just yeah. actually think you're getting to work a bit quicker. Uh, is it rebellion? I don't know. But the scooter thing, I, um, I sort of get it with kids, but even they annoy me because you see the parents carrying it around them more than yeah. me ever you see them on it. But who made it acceptable? For like grown up city workers to scoot around on these stupid little <laughs> things. It's actually, I am quite angry about it, aren't I? I don't know quite how angry it was. Who um, made this okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, like these, and then it's just, and then it's these segues and stuff just perpetuate the whole nonsense. Like this, these electronic ones, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I know you like your sort of sci-fi things like that, so maybe there's something kind of about... Oh, no, I, I, no I have the same feelings okay. about segues as <laughs> I do about grown men on skateboards. Okay, cool. like, I, mean, I mean, it's it's not even that much quicker than... Like, maybe if you've got a disability or something that are really exactly. useful, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not all the people I see on them. No. Especially these... I mean, I can't imagine that... What are they, the little... Yeah, they're like hoverboard types. The like, hoverboard yeah, things, yeah. yeah. Like... Nobody with a disability can use that. No, right? yeah, exactly. so that's just a choice you've made. <laughs> In fact, you're disabling yourself more by having one of those things. You're making yourself less able. It's re- it, yeah. And like, it's people on there. Uh, my brother calls them rascals. What do you call those things that, like, <laughs> I don't know why that is. You know, like mobility scooters, I suppose. Okay. Like, right, that yeah. makes, you know, that makes sense. Though I still have yeah. a little bit of a bugbear about people, like, along the sort of footpaths yeah. on them and stuff. I'm like, okay. But, um, just feels to me like I missed out on something. Like th- that's one of the ones where I didn't get the memo, and that everyone yeah. else seems totally okay with this, and I'm but absolutely not. Yeah, no, um, I, 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 I completely get it. Because I think what it is is like uh, maybe this is maybe we've got bad misconceptions here. Yeah. But it's just it's they're things for kids. Yeah. That's what they are. Yeah. So maybe I don't have a right to be annoyed with that. Maybe you can 
Yeah, maybe maintain your inner child. Maybe this is the thing, and I'm always this person as a theatre maker being like, oh, as adults, we sort of stop learning how to play, and that's why theatre is so great because all we're doing is just being, playing dress up and pretending <laughs> to be other people. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the joy of it. I get to sit in a room and watch people pretend to be other people and yeah. basically play. Um, what a great thing. So then, and then, but then there's me going, but no, you can't have fun on a scooter. But they also don't know they're having fun. I think that's the thing. It's yeah, like, if you're using it for your commute, like, how much fun yeah. are you having? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it just doesn't look like it's like joy, 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 going to work, and then oh, put it away, and then I go at work, and then joy, joy, joy. And they're just using it to like get somewhere. Hey, but then also, I've never stepped on it in my life. Maybe I'd be a complete convert and <laughs> yeah, screw the soon, bike. As soon as you make that push, first yeah. push. So. <gasps> yeah, <laughs> this is what's eagle. been missing all my life. <laughs> I think it was, and also I think it's slightly because I remember the first like adult to make them cool was Robbie Williams and I've got an issue with Robbie Williams uh, yeah, and I remember I mean... he there was a like glass or someone he like scooted onto stage on these micro scooters and everyone went oh, wow and then it's but I was kind of hoping it was a fad I was kind of hoping like I was going to be the sort of 2007 fad or whatever and now it's 10 years later and people are actually like embraced it as part of their lives yeah I mean yeah. Th- the other so this is, like you've picked on something that really annoys me as well. so, uh, like all right, fine. Maybe you're embracing your inner child. Okay, whatever. I can live with that, right? But because you know, I live in Bristol. That's where we are right now. Mm. There's a lot of people who choose non-conventional modes of travel, mm. and what they do, mm. even if it's more convenient for them, is inconvenience other people. For sure. Because yeah. you know, if you're on a bike, there's tons of cycle paths. Yeah. But if you're on a scooter, like, yeah. they don't care. No, they go I think you should want. have to be on a cycle path if you're <laughs> yeah. using a hoverboard or a scooter. Then as a cyclist, I'd be like, no, get out of the way. They're clogging up the cycle path. Get out of my face. Um, I just think that they should be allowed to be tripped over and, like, not be able to... No one should have repercussions for it. I think, like, there should be some law that, like, they're allowed to embrace their inner child in this way, but if someone pushes you, it's okay? Like, it's, like you asked for it? Um... <laughs> You put yourself in a... <laughs> so it's awful. So I always say the same about me on a bike, but um, no. Yeah. And also, I lose umbrellas. How did these people not lose these things? I'd put it down somewhere, and it would just be... I don't understand where they go. So if I opened a whole can of worms here, for me, <laughs> mentally, it's just too much. Um, so that was that was kind of like... That was my major thing, mm-hmm. which was a sort of... Um, obviously something quite close to my heart now the other thing is quite a new thing I don't even know if this is a if this is a universal thing so I've mentioned it to a few people and they're like I don't even know what you're talking about but there's these like debit cards that aren't debit cards they're like called um, Monzo cards and they've become very okay. popular in London oh right yeah that maybe there London yeah that yeah, there yeah. London yeah. but maybe it's sort of spreading out and then can I like an app and a card and I was trying to, my housemate was trying to explain to me about why they're so great. I still don't quite get it. But she was like, well, you can, you put money on it. It's like, it's like you have money on this card. So like a debit card. Yeah. But when the money runs out, that's it. Like that's, you cut off, you can't use it anymore. So you basically top up this card with your debit, like online. So you've got this card that you use to pay for things. Right. But then if you go into the coffee shop and you go and use it and you don't have any money left, then you, I was like, that sounds awful. Like, what do you do? And she said, oh, well, you can put more money on it. So you can then like on your phone move money from your into right. that right so d- that's sort of completely defeats the object of the why this seems like it's things in life that people create to so it's hopefully simplify life in some way but yeah. just make it more complicated and it becomes a fad people go oh that's a nice pink card you've got what's one of those and everyone wants one and then i never really understand what the point of it just i mean just don't have an overdraft, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, because then your debit card will work exactly like exactly. <laughs> when I you just, run out of money. It's funny, like, I don't know, I, maybe it's because I am slightly, um, like, OCD sort of anal about my spending that I... And as being a freelancer, like, you kind of have to be on, t- on top of all those things. And as being yeah. a self-employed person, you're doing your taxes and all that sort of yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. But at the end of every month, I kind of like look through my receipts and be like, oh my God, I spent that much on food this... Like, and it kind of makes me go, you know, cap yourself, make sure you don't... Yeah. But people just, I don't know, I'm an, I'm an anomaly, I think. I don't think people do it. So this is, I think also this thing is it, so it, che- it keeps a track of where you've been spending money. So you can go on this app and it'll be like, you've spent 20 quid at Costa this week. And you're oh, like, okay. gosh, okay, I'm not going to go to Costa so much anymore. But does it? 
I mean, I, I can sort of see that, but then I sort of do that anyway. And it's kind of... I feel like if you've, if you've made the step to get this monzo card yeah right if you've taken that step because you're like i need to yeah i need to regulate how much money i'm using i need to create a separate account for my <laughs> thing and i need to be able to check exactly where i, I feel like you are prepared to do that work just off your bank yeah. balance anyway your bank statement yeah, it yeah. says on the bank statement how much you spent on those things yeah but yeah i know i'm kind of a bit baffled so I'm like, it's a debit card. And then someone else said to me, which sounds like quite a good thing, and maybe this is where it started, is that when you go overseas, if you put money on it, it does, you don't get those charges, like the sort of like okay. percentage. So if you're using a cash machine or a tap it on it, you don't get the 2% or whatever charge or whatever you might be. And I was like, well, that makes sense. That's a good yeah, travelling. Yeah, if you yeah. travel a lot, I kind of understand that. But then also lots of banks sort things out like that now and go, we'll just not charge you. Yeah. Feels to me like a little fad thing where people go, oh, it makes my life so much easier. But then I look at it and go, no, I think it's really complicating your life in a way that you could yeah. just... And it, and I just don't feel like we had these issues. I don't know. Is it 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Why has this become a thing uh, now? People, money yeah. has become a different thing yeah, together. Yeah. I think... What this really sounds like to me is someone has fixed a problem that wasn't really a problem. Yeah. But they've successfully managed to convince a lot of people of it. <laughs> this is a thing that you need in your life. Like, yeah. It's like those books. <laughs> when people buy a book telling them how to like um, look after their money better or not spend so much, I'm like, can you not see the irony in that, guys? You're buying a book to do this. Like you're all that's that's that's, that's nine pounds ninety nine that you've just spent. And you're probably yeah. going to put that on your shelf and never look at that again. And then it's just people really love buying into these things. Oh, they're going to sort my life out for me. Oh, that'll sort out so many problems. And all they're doing is causing yeah. more. I mean, and I'm sure I have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Scanning your bookshelves, making sure they're not you anyway. Well, not specifically with books, <laughs> but I'm certain I have cottoned on to it. Oh, this will help my life. Yeah. This will be like. Yeah. I, put, I put so many notepads to just. Right, what I'll do is I'll write down what I'm going to do with my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I will actually plan a diary. I will have uh, I will have a schedule. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, that, that is. I'm really committed to that for about three days. That's so true. In fact, I was saying I was chatting on the sofa to my friend this morning for like two hours and most of it was talking about how do you what sort of diary do you have <laughs> do you do it online or do you because she's like i've got one of those asana ones and i've also got my google one and then i've got like just a written downy one and then i've got post-it notes <laughs> like, but i never seem to know where i'm meant to be and i'm like why are you so surprised because <laughs> we're like everyone's telling us this is the way to do it we're like oh no because that's the way to do it and then we're like i don't know <laughs> who I am, where I am, what day is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we can laugh about it, it's great. <laughs> if you don't, you cry. See, if Shakespeare had written a play about that, that's something someone would go see. <laughs> the existential problems of too many diaries. <laughs> um. Um, all right, okay. Uh, so let's let's find out something nicer then. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what 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 is your hidden gem? My hidden gem, which I think would make the world a better place if everyone knew about this and partook in them, are point and click adventure games. Oh, I love a good point and click adventure uh, game. Yeah, man. They've died off a bit, haven't they? They have, but my friend, um, I'll tell you something. You can thank me later. There's <laughs> one called Thimbleweed Park, which was okay. made by the people that made Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion and... Return of the Tentacle and Day of the Tentacle and all those all those brilliant LucasArts ones. Yeah. And they've made and it was only um, I think it was only made this year or last year. And you can get it on your phone or your Android, you know, uh, right, yeah, tablet yeah. and stuff. I think you can get a new PC as well. It's brilliant and it's like for me going back to when I first discovered point and click adventure games. And oh, nice. but they've also they've not just kind of relied on the old like same old jokes or the same old kind of structure. They've really gone to town with getting to play lots of different characters like normally in these things you're sort of like yeah I suppose my favourite probably is Monkey Island where you're this pirate Guybrush Threepwood and basically Pirates of the Caribbean is just based on Monkey Island yeah yeah, just, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're sort of yeah um, for those who are less know, you're basically being Orlando Bloom walking around but he's a bit geekier he's so much geekier yeah, yeah. Um, and you're like you can pick up things talk to people you're basically solving logistical problems in fun yeah. and exciting and interesting ways 
and they've done that but you can be um you start off as and you're sort of like this molder and scully tiny of characters so you're okay. like trying to solve a murder and you, but you can switch between the two of them. You can give each other items that they might be able to use in one way that you can't use in one right, way and stuff. Okay. Just, and you, so you think that's what it's going to be, you guys solving a murder. And then this like, clown character comes into it, and then you start playing. Then you can be the clown guy. <laughs> and he's called, um, oh my god, uh, he's like, he's this abuse clown. So he just, every, every other word is beep, beep. And, um, <laughs> uh, and he's like, kind of, he's got, he's been cursed. So, um, his type kind of act was just going out and offending people and the story goes that like 10, 10 years ago or whatever he, he went out and he insulted this woman she turned out to be a witch and she made her like ma- like he couldn't get his makeup off and okay. so he's like been trying to like shift this um, this makeup and this persona in whatever for the past 10 years um, and so he's trying to that's his little sort of journey and then there's then it, and then all the other little characters come in that you can play I kind of don't want to spoil it but it's <laughs> I feel like I am a... I'm not a gamer at all, really. I don't... Well... No, I kind of am. Not in the sense of, like, I sit and play kind of Call of Duty kind of games and things like yeah, that. But no, I grew up with my... I've still got my nares and all those sorts of things. And, like, I love that side. I haven't really moved on beyond <laughs> probably the Monkey Island. <laughs> but, um, but I just feel like these games are so... They're using logic and they're problem solving and they're yeah. like you have to sit and think and work things out and you can't just find like a quick and easy solution and they yeah. I think a lot of people kind of go through life just wanting everything to be solved for them like Monzo yeah. card here we go but like whereas if you actually just take, take time and sit down it can feel really rewarding when you just work something out and yeah so, no I, I absolutely get that like yeah. and I think I think we're getting more impatient as a species thanks to mm. technology yeah. But I found myself becoming more impatient as I get older yeah. because of this. I think, like, mm. like you know, we're sat next to a PlayStation there. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not a Call of Duty person mm. particularly, but, but like these days, you play computer games, even if they're big, huge, yeah. like adventure games, which you know, I still, I still like them. But you can't die. Like, you, no. if you die, and then you just yeah. you start from a little bit further back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm like, where's the reward in this? <laughs> yeah. Like, but, but have you played? Oh my gosh, though. But if like, I, I still play on my NES occasionally. Or like, get Mario out, like the Mario three. And when you die, you're like dead. Yeah. You have to go. You've just gone all those worlds. <laughs> yeah. Nightmare. Absolute. Like, yeah. I kind of want kids to experience that and go ah. But maybe they'll get more angry. Maybe we. Maybe that makes people angry. Reminds me of when my brother had Double Dragon. Do you ever play Double Dragon? It was like yeah, one of those, yeah. uh, like kind of kung fu street fighter type thing. And it was his birthday, and uh, they were like, "Oh, come down to downstairs for cake," and turn the TV off. But I saw that they'd left the NES on, like the light was still on. Obviously, as you did, because if you you couldn't switch it off and restart yeah, yeah, because yeah. you couldn't save anything, <laughs> so you just turn the TV off, but leave it running and go and have your dinner and come back and switch the telly back on again. Yeah. As a child, I didn't reckon. I was I thought it was being helpful. I was like, "Oh, oh they've no. left the." Oh, they've left the console on. <laughs> oh, I'll turn that off. <laughs> Downstairs, eating birthday cake. Brother runs back up saying, Wah! Wah! And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? Yeah. Bursting into tears. Like, it caused fights. They caused fights. Game saving has saved some save some family oh I've, I've got a problem with the, the, the introduction of the save file uh, I have a problem with the the like, yeah. now that now we don't even need that yeah, like, yeah, the computer yeah. saves it automatically it's every true, 10 actually. seconds yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, all right, okay. we're all safe we're all safe because <laughs> um, part of the joy of a computer game that's point and click adventure yeah. games is the challenge of it yeah yeah it's not so everything's it's, just there but then there yeah. are some games that you get like um, Red Dead Redemption or like L.A. Noir, which I know was like every, no one was so much of a fan of, but I kind of loved it because it reminded me of those. Th- there are those <laughs> ones that you kind of going around solving puzzles and yeah. In yeah. Fact, I bought them for my dad because for some reason he decided to buy an Xbox for Christmas because he could watch iPlayer on it. It's back in the day when they didn't really <laughs> iPlayer on the telly. Um, so I was like, oh well, I'll get him some like games, you know, like adventure games essentially. But yeah. They're just too difficult now. I've got lots of getting on top, of, getting in cars and on horses and learning, right, the, you yeah, know, too yeah. many buttons. Point, click. That's the joy. Yeah. It's quite, keep, they keep it simple. 
Well, I mean, some of them keep it simple. There are yeah. some horrifically obtuse answers yeah. to... I mean, there are listicle articles about, <laughs> yeah. about the most ridiculous solutions to... Because there was those ones called, like, Mist and Raven, I think, that were kind of some of the slightly early, more obscure, like, yeah, yeah. problems. Sort of, I never really got... They were a bit beyond me, I think, at my age, like, the age I was then. But, yeah, and I, yeah, I just kind of find a real joy in... And I always complete them too quick. I always spend a spe- sit down for four hours and can't stop playing them, and then it's over, and then I'm really sad. Yeah. And I want them to make another one. I also tend to fall in love with one of the characters in the film. <laughs> Just like, oh, right now. Yeah. Oh, I'm into you now. I'm yeah, like, right. yeah. Irish Streetwood. There was one called Simon the Sorcerer. He was my first love. <laughs> I remember I had a t shirt with him on it, and just, yeah. Wow, I'm really sad. <laughs> There's one... Um, did you ever play the Discworld? Yeah! That was brilliant. They were brilliant! And, like, you Rinse can't... Wind. I can't get that to work on a PC anymore. Like, no. I've still got a, an old sold-out software... Yeah, yeah. ...version of it somewhere. Um, Sometimes they do, like, this, the the um, Monkey Island and the Simon the Sorcerer ones they've made into, like, apps. So they, yeah, might right, have okay. ma- they might have done a Discworld one. I'm not sure. I'll have to look for that. But it was also times before the internet, so I remember when I wanted to cheat, I had to go and buy a cheat Yeah, book. you had to buy books, didn't you? You had to buy, like, walkthrough guides, yeah. And I remember, like, my being so stuck on Discworld and just frustratingly stuck. I think it was something about giving a... I think you had to give someone a date so they'd go to the toilet and then an octopus... I can't remember, it was yeah. one of those things. I just could not for the life of me figure it out, and then my dad would take me to, like, PC World or whatever, one of those, and I just... He'd like stand in guard and we were like flicking through the paper. <laughs> oh, right, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and, um, or like my dad would buy them and behind my back and then sort of ration them out to me, like for, uh, okay. uh, to do chores. Like, <laughs> well, if you wash the dishes, then I'll tell you what you're meant to be doing. And that, like, oh, dad. And then, like, <laughs> great tools of manipulation, these click and adventure games. Yeah, yeah that's all amazing. Sorts. Um, a lot of fun and kind of like, I think. I think valuable. <laughs> think of me. <laughs> yeah, maybe if Donald Trump had played some flick and point adventure games in his youth, we would be in a different, different um, state. I don't think <laughs> you can cure sociopathy Damn. that way. <laughs> Damn, I really well, we put it to the test. Play um, yeah, John Ronson, yeah. what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, okay, so we'll. Um, I'm, I'm happy with that. Are you ha- Is there any more you need to get out about um, point and click? I don't think so. Just let everyone play Thimbleweed Park, and you'll understand. Um, yeah, well, don't be put now. off by don't be put off by the many many pixels that you'll you'll see. Like it's you know they still <laughs> stuck to the old <laughs> the, the stuck to the old traditions. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Broken Sword fans will be fine. Oh yeah, King's Quest. And, oh yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, just do some quick fire questions. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's your your your. Favourite and your least favourite kinds of thing, mm-hmm. different mediums. Okay. Um, so we'll start with uh, your favourite TV show. Favourite TV show. Um, that's I don't watch masses. T- I think it's probably probably the TV show I go to the most are um, you think called like Forensic Files. Okay. Where <laughs> I like watching documentary type things. And right. my comfort one is these ones that they've they're in the states. They've been running for years and years. And I think they're like twentieth series now, and it's just stories of like how people have been murdered or killed in some way, and then they discover how like the reason they've worked out how the murder is through like some tiny ridiculous forensic evidence. Okay. And it's like the technology and the how they discovered this like tiny shard of. A headlight from a car that they got one number off, and they took to a thing, and then they and it's um yeah, it's kind of fat. So that's my kind of that's really my comfort TV. Like okay. some people choose Star Trek, some people Forensic Files. Um, um, yeah, they can be a bit gruesome. Um, and they're always narrated by an American guy. Yeah. And um, the, what's kind of sad about it is that you always know who'd done it from the very beginning because it's like. Charlene and her <laughs> husband Dennis. And you're like, I think the husband Dennis did it. Um, <laughs> who loved golf? Oh, okay, it's with a golf club, some yeah, sort, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, that, yeah, probably those. Probably those. You search Netflix for like really dire documentary series, and unfortunately, that's probably, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
You were probably expecting some like beautiful theatrical <laughs> Shakespearean yeah. something or other. It's not. So. No, no, no. I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> uh, your least favorite TV show. Uh, least favorite TV show. I don't really get sort of um, like made in Chelsea things. That's probably kind of obviously yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. I don't not on board with the Towie. Don't know really what these things are. Yeah, it's sort of like. It's weird, isn't it? Like, scripted reality TV. Yeah. I don't really understand it. Yeah. Like, these are real people playing the role as themselves, but slightly more of a bell end? Is, <laughs> yeah. that, is that the show I'm watching? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why, why? <laughs> like, I'll watch, you, I'll watch your sort of bake-offs, and, you, and I was even watching The Apprentice this morning. There's something about that, because they're not scripted because and they are just bell ends but like yeah you know you've decided to come on stage <laughs> and present yourself in this horrific way maybe also because they've got a task involved they've got to do and i'm like oh my god why didn't they do this logically it would have made much more sense to just talk to that person <laughs> um but yeah it's the other one it's the and it all started in america with mtv doing those like um oh uh, they're like so the, the, like the, the, real, the real world real world and yeah, yeah. And it's uh, it's just got worse and worse and worse. So I, uh, yeah, that made in Chelsea, Love Island. I don't even know what that is, but I just put them all in the same bucket and throw yeah. that bucket quite far away from me. That's that's fair. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, your favourite book. Um, I will always go to A Hundred Years of Solitude by okay. um, uh, Marquez, uh, Gabriel Marquez, because he. Gail Garcia Marquez because I, but if you ask me why now I just remember it being the first book as a sort of 90, 18, 19 year old reading it's sort of magical realism piece and I was drawn into like it's the sort of story of a family spanning a hundred years or more and you you feel like you're kind of grasping at beautiful images and kind of these um, lives and then as soon as you're you sort of grasp on your fleeting onto the next and sort of following okay. a kind of it's like a really great movie or one of those like you're on a journey and you don't quite know where it's going um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I kind of like those but I haven't read it in years I just remember when people ask me what's your favourite book I'm like oh 100 years of solitude and they go oh yeah and they probably read it way more recently than you go blah 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 I'm like yeah I can't remember yeah. I just remember the feeling it left me with but actually I read a book really recently that's not called um, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. I've been doing, hopefully, like, making it into a play. That's cool. Um, that's, yeah, I read a lot of plays, actually. That's the problem. That's why it was hard yeah, to think yeah, about yeah. books, because I just read loads of script. But um, it's about a man in 1940s Harlem, um, who, a, a, a black man who is, he was at university in, like, a southern state that was set up by loads of white guys, and he gets chucked out for a sort of ridiculous reason. They send him to New York. And he just, he's sort of, it's kind of Dickensian in a way, in the sense that he just sort of goes on this journey and gets picked up by people that take him under his wing and he sort of follows in, he takes on a role they give him. So he gets picked up by the Brotherhood and becomes this great public speaker talking about okay. civil rights and women's rights and um, and like, oh, I'm good at this, they think it is. And then it sort of, and then when he starts having his own ideas and things, it goes too far and they don't like that. So he has not his fit in there. Oh, okay. And then so when he, but then by his, like, the other... His other brothers are going, you know, there's this sort of... I suppose what they could have, like, the Black Panther movement back then, but, like, going, you're not going far enough. And he ends up just deciding to live underground because he's just... It's easier to be invisible than wow. having to deal with not really knowing, like, who is the coward's way out. But I'd rather just almost pass in this white man's world as kind of as invisible as possible rather than try and speak out or try... Yeah. You know, so it's it, it's you kind of really go on this journey with him. At the end of it, you go, God, this is this poor young guy who just <laughs> wanted to like succeed in life and, you know, be a um, a great public speaker or be a, an intellectual, be an academic, and then he just gets sort of thrown around and taken and yeah, for other used for other people's purposes. Um, purposes yeah. Oh wow. Um, yeah, really, and it was the first book in a while I've read, and I've gone. I want to read that all over again from the beginning because I feel like right. this guy here is different from this one here, and I want to go skip back. Just to see that. back and work that. Yeah, oh, that's that's, that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, uh, your, your least favorite book? 
I haven't read it, but I just know I'd hate it. Is like the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Oh, you wouldn't hate it. That's the problem. Really? Because right? you'd you'd because I've got I've got it somewhere here. I think, I think or maybe I borrowed it off my mum. Uh, but um, so I've talked about Dan Brown's writing in this podcast before. <laughs> Dan Brown is an awful writer. Yeah, this is I, it. like just bad writing. The sentences, no. Uh, I don't. He doesn't know how to do prose, yeah. but somehow. Like, <sighs> right? There's a there's an episode of Red Dwarf, right. the, the 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 BBC sci-fi comedy sitcom, um, where hungover Lister gives uh, Rimmer a a sandwich. Yeah, and it's an awful sandwich. It's got terrible, terrible, terrible ingredients. Like it just sat, like when he's <laughs> when he's telling him how to make it, it's, it sounds atrocious. Yeah, and he eats it. And it's amazing. And Rimmer's like, this sandwich is you. Because all the ingredients are wrong, but for some reason it works. Right, right. That is Dan Brown's <laughs> writing. Because there is nothing, I think, defensible in, like, just, like, if you did a critical analysis of the prose. Yeah, yeah. But you're hooked. Really? Like, I read that book in two days. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, but God. I don't understand. <laughs> this is, and maybe this is it, because I, I just remember when everyone had it. I think going, I was travelling around, I was doing the gap year thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Going to Australia and whatever. And, God, awful. But um, everyone had this book. Like, the, yeah. why do they always choose the biggest book in the world to start taking holiday with? And I just sort of glance over people's shoulders at it and going, that's not even a sentence. What do you think? <laughs> Like everyone had been brainwashed in some way and I was just some I was the only one in this sort of like Stephen King esque the stand kind of way like left going, What is going on? Why are these people like glued to this book? And maybe I just maybe part of subconsciously I wanted to not be I wanted to avoid exactly what you're saying, like going, Oh and yeah, getting yeah. pulled in but um no, I guess that sort of I guess it's a hard thing to say. If I haven't read the book, it's hard to say it's my least favourite book. But that's sort of Pulp Fiction where I just go, I'm not even going to pick that up because I can see yeah, yeah, yeah. from reading the chapter, like the fifth page of that chapter, I'm not going to feel... That's yeah. fair. <laughs> um, okay, so your uh, ooh favourite movie? Um, yeah, if I'm going to be really honest, it's Three Men and a Little Lady. Like, that's really... <laughs> the sequel to <laughs> yeah. Three Men and a Baby. <laughs> it is... So superior to the original. It's the only sequel that really is superior. Though I suppose Godfather, like Godfather Part Two, is fucking brilliant as well. Excuse me, um, but yeah, um, no, Three Men and a Little Lady. <laughs> yeah, Three Men and a Little Lady. Uh, it was like, I don't know why. It's the it's my comfort film. <laughs> I love. I love. It's got some great British actors in there. You've got like Fiona Shaw in it, and like. Um, uh, Sheila Hancock and people like that who are just like, why are you doing this dreadful? But it's not dreadful, like, brilliant, I understand entirely, but, you know, like, it's just a bit of a money in her, and they're brilliant in it, and I just, I don't know, I, I guess I quite enjoy, it's written from a, like, American perspective about Britain, and it's got all right, of the sort yeah. of cliches about the sort of vicar in the, the sort of vicar character at the end who's just a bit of a doddery old whatever, and then, like, driving through sheep, and everyone drives really crap cars, and don't, they don't have, like, soft toilet paper, and... Like, all kind of true stuff. Yeah. But, like, I quite enjoy it when someone... We get to take the mick out of Americans so much. Yeah, I quite yeah. like it when they get to reverse it on us. And, it's, yeah. And also, it's got a bit about theatre in it. Like, it's got... um, So, the the the, la- the lady's mother, um, she's an actor. And the first sort of scene is um, uh, Tom Selleck's character coming in and talking to her while she's in her dressing room getting ready for, for a show. Yeah. I don't know, I always, maybe there was something in that and him basically being totally in love with her but not being able to tell her and right, having yeah, this yeah. sort of like masculine complex. But I think. <laughs> um, and I kind of always love the concept of these three guys like raising this girl and then her coming into it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's fair, like I'm not, I'm not saying it's know. a bad, like, it's, uh, it's, but it's a bold choice for it's favourite a favourite movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, but I have some really terrible taste. But I mean, the other one, if I'm going to be really, really honest, and this is painful to just like have actually on, uh, on the record, <laughs> it's like Titanic. Like, oh, oh wow. I could have gone there. Yeah. I, but like so much to the sense that, like extent that I went to see it at the Royal Albert Hall with a live orchestra being being conducted by James Horner, R.I.P. Right. Um, 
and also watched it in like 3D around at a friend's house sort of thing like only kind of last year so okay <laughs> am I getting chucked out of the house <laughs> no, no 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 um, I don't again it's something about the age I was when I saw it and I just kind of um, it's like 11 year old girl kind of do you know just drawn into by it all drawn into the Hollywood machine that was James Cameron <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah. completely unfictional the romance stuff but yeah I could have said something really cool and been like Magnolia or something like that, but I've decided to be honest with you. No, I, I, I appreciate it. I really do. I really do. Um, all right, your least favourite movie? Oh, it's probably going to be something that's like really cool. I, um, I'm going to say Godfather Part 3 because uh, I got angered by it. Right, okay. I was okay. really angered by it. I, only really, I never watched The Godfather until this year, any of them. Yeah. Um, I was working on a play that um, was about the producer of The Godfather, the first Godfather film, a guy called Bob Evans. And um, he like he discovered like all these brilliant... Oh, Harold and Maud, that's another one of my favourite films. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Too many. But like he, he discovered the script for Harold and Maud. Like, he, has all, he, he, he produced Chinatown and like all these incredible things. I was like, you know what? I've never seen The Godfather and everyone's going, what, you're doing this play? And like, <laughs> so I watched the first one and was like, oh, my gosh absolutely incredible I understand now why yeah. why everyone loves Al Pacino like <laughs> I never really got it before I like I like the scent of a woman he's kind of good in heat but other than that I was like I don't really get this obsession but he was it's incredible and then I, the next day I had to watch the second one I was like gotta watch Godfather Part 2 oh my god Robert De Niro I get it um, and then so like third, and everyone was like Anna don't watch the third one just don't watch it you don't need to I was like no I need to watch the third one don't do it to yourself I was like I'm gonna watch it Oh, I was so angry. It was just... I wasted three hours of my life on this piece of, like, yeah, dross. It was awful. It just ruined everything that you loved about the first two films and just from a height. From a height. (laughs) Um, And it's just kind of... uh, yeah, I was really upset. And I, mem- I don't really like normally have to pause a film or stop whatever, but I remember like pausing it and like checking how much left of it. Oh my God, there's still an hour and a half. And yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever watched The God... If you're a... I d- yeah, it's here somewhere. Somewhere. Right. Um... But it's... Uh, I, I kind of wish I'd taken everyone's advice. I know that I wouldn't. I know that if it happened again, I'd probably still watch it, but it, it angered me. I didn't realise I could get so angry about it. I did. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's fair. Um, <laughs> Sophia Coppola is just like she's dread. She's so awful, like an okay director. And Francis Ford Coppola is just like, anyway, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, just because you, what's your favourite play? Oh wow. Okay, favourite play. Jeez. There's a play called The Pillow Man by Martin McDonough, okay. which I've never seen. I've only ever read. And I really want to do it one day. And it's right. it's a brilliant four-hander. Quite long as well. It's probably like three, three and a half hours. Right. For, for a modern play, like it was only written in the early noughties, maybe. Okay. Um, and, it's a, and it's about... Um, it's sort of set in a slightly future dystopian sort of world, possibly. Never really specifies. And it's two police officers interrogating this writer... Right. Um, suspecting him of murder um, because he writes these sort of Hans Christian Andersen esque grim tale type stories, right, yeah, yeah. and there's been all these murders happening just like his stories. Right. And um, so he's the prime suspect. And also, then they're going, Why do you write this? You're a sick freak. Mm. Like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like someone it, it, talking to Nabokov or something about Lolita and going, Who are you? <laughs> but, um, and uh, and he and this writer has this sort of brother with learning difficulties um, who lives with him and um, throughout the sort of interrogation you also have these moments where they read some of his stories aloud um, or he reads them or his brother reads them and their stories are brilliant so the story of the pillow man the pillow man is a car- is a, um, a sort of a monster type character that goes to children um, when like before anything really tragic's happened to them in their lives and says to them like you're going to have a really tragic life. Um, I recommend you sort of end it now. And these kids are going, no, I can't, like, um, I, my mum and dad love me and la, 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 I'm so happy. And he's like, so he'll go, really, no, here's the bleach. Do you know, just sort of drink mm. it if you want it. It's just there sort of thing. Wow. 
Um, and they're like, no, 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 and they never take his advice. And then sure enough, these children go into adults who then get a, are abused or something happens to them. And then the pillar man comes back to them in later life and is like, see, should have done what I said. And it's like, whoa, it's like these really dark, dark stories and kind of like, that's... Maybe I've slightly ruined it. Okay, but no. But like, so, <laughs> uh, so actually when these horrific... It sort of in a way is kind of like... So when these horrific deaths happen to young children or like when they drink the bleach under the sink or when something happens like that, they've done an accident that's happened that they've done, they say, oh, the pillow man's been there. Right. And it's like they've saved them, if anything. Yeah. So it's like... So, and there's these story of like Piper of Hamlin that gets sort of rewritten. And Anyway, I don't want to ruin the end. So I'm not going to say much more. But and maybe maybe I do like this magical realism as I think. But the brother, yeah, becomes quite an interesting character within it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad at that. But it's 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 kind of brilliant, and I just sort of it's it sort of shouldn't work, and it does. And when they originally did it, I think it was it was David Tennant and Jim Broadbent and like I think like Cillian Murphy or someone like that. It's a wow. really like really yeah. cool cast. Um, I wish I'd seen it. I think it was at the National, but it was like... I don't even know how well it was received, but I just always was like, I want to... One day. One day. This. <laughs> and it's just something about... it's a, There's something in it, there's loads within it, but it's kind of like censorship for writers and like what is what is too far and what is like... Okay. You know, um, when can we offend and when can we not? When should we self-censor or when... Right, yeah. Or just because you write something, does it make you that person or, you know, kind of... Yeah. Or also, it's a bit like people going, oh, you play those violent video games, you're going to be a violent person. Like, people that read these stories, are they going to then have... Like, yeah, it's yeah. sort of taking an element of free will away from us by saying that we're that sort of programmed to yeah, be influenced yeah. by outside. Um, it's his kind of argument. But, yeah. So I think that's probably my favourite play. Wow. That I've that's read, good. never seen. <laughs> that, that's fair. Yeah. Um, all right, well, your least favourite play? Um... Because so many I've seen recently have just been dire. Uh, <laughs> um, what about I me? Mean, I should think of a play that I don't like that everyone else seems to like and I don't get it. I don't really. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. I've had this conversation with people before, but I don't really get Romeo and Juliet. I'm not a big fan of the Romeo oh, okay. and Juliet. But then I feel like I've just never seen a production of it that I've ever. But then the film version is pretty cool, like the Ro- the Leonardo DiCaprio. Again, I'm going right. back to my sort of. <laughs> yeah, I mean um, it's, it's all right. It's all right. Though. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, maybe oh, no. I can't really remember. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it's that. I'm just not. Right. May, I'm going to say that just because I suppose it's so done. When you talk about Shakespeare, that bloody gets done all the time. It's done all the time. Yeah. I don't really know what it's doing or saying. It's just a sort of a romance that I could never really buy into. I never believe in love at first sight stuff. Which is kind of saying that Titanic's my favourite film alongside Three Men and a Little Lady. It scrubs all that away, but like Shakespeare couldn't do it very well. <laughs> and, uh, I never believe it. It's, um, it's, it's much better realised. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? God, uh, I'm never going to get any work again. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but this I just sort of... Yeah, I've never really bought into it, I suppose, and I get it gets done a lot. I don't like the way it's done for young people. It's like, oh, it's a young person's play. They'll right. get this, because yeah. there's young people in it. I'm like, I don't think... It, for me, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be the first time people access Shakespeare's from doing Romeo and Juliet, because it's kind of one of the easy ones that can... I, I don't... Yeah, I don't get that. Fair? Yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah. If someone was going to make the story of your life, mm. what medium would you like them to do that in? And what would you call it? Um, so, I think I quite like the idea of, um, of, a, of actually like a sort of serial-esque podcast of my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where there's sort of phone conversations with people that knew me. There's sort of like tidbits of parts of my life and people were kind of piecing together who I was through a oh, sort wow. of like 10 part podcast series of my life um, and like people at the end of it can make up their own choices to whether I 
was weird, like <laughs> I was justified to be on this planet or not in some way or another. <laughs> Going, yeah, she didn't. She was a waste of space. <laughs> God, I just went through ten episodes of that just to decide that she was totally funny. Or, ooh, maybe she did steal that pencil off, you know, Jane in year five. And it's been kind of having to deal with the... <laughs> the guilt of that ever since. Yeah. That's the... Someone who can just sort of... Some psychoanalysts who can sit and psychoanalyse my actions and, like... Yeah, maybe probably just make my life sound a bit more interesting than it actually was. I think, I, yeah, they can do that. Okay, can, yeah, yeah. It. It's the choice of editing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of fun. Um, okay. Yeah. What would you call it? Um... I think um, I might take some inspiration from... When you were asking me my favourite plays, I just realised those were the ones. Um, but my, one of my favourite playwrights is Samuel Beckett. And he has this um, he has this saying... Well, it's a quote from one of his books. says, No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. So I think it would be called oh. Fail Better. Oh, so I think that's what I'm always trying to learn in life, is how just to fail, but just a bit better at each time. Yeah, I think that's that's a skill we all need. <laughs> so yeah, um, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Anna. Mm. Um, podcasters of the future, feel free to use <laughs> any snippets from this for for, for fail better. Hey. <laughs> um, keep smashing it. Thank you. Love me. Brilliant. Wow. So that was Anna. I really, really enjoyed listening back to this episode. I was super tired when she came round to my flat. I had not slept because of, well, work, insomnia and assorted mental health issues. So Anna really brightened my day, actually, but I didn't have a strong recollection of our chat afterwards. So I felt like I was listening to it for the first time. I love learning about the inner workings of a medium like theatre, which I feel like I'm properly outside of. That's really what I get out of this podcast, I think, talking to these amazing people about about the things that they, they do and learning about it. But I'd completely forgotten about the adults on scooters thing, and I really tapped into my petty rage like I don't think anyone else on this podcast has done before. I, I hope you really enjoyed it. Anna has a website and a Twitter, which I'll put links to uh, on the website, thatthispod.com. I also always tag in my guests when I tweet about the show. So if you want a slightly easier way to connect with these lovely folks from your phone, do follow the podcast at thatthispod. I also have a personal account, which you can get to from there if you fancy reading my hilarious jokes, angry politics and outbursts of existential despair i'm trying to think of some cool fun stuff i can do in these talky bits now that the theme tune competition has finished thank you for helping me choose i'll be boring my friends with some of my ideas but if you've got any thoughts for something you might think is fun then get in touch you can tweet me or email at geraint at that this pod.com. i'm also thinking about getting an instagram for this podcast but I, i'm not really sure how you take photos of a podcast Anyway, next week I'll be speaking to Martin Pilgrim, who is a comedian that is brilliant. You may not have heard of him before. He's done a few shows of his own, but you will definitely know some of his jokes, even if you've not seen him. He's had several of them go viral and get stolen by people on the internet. We talk a lot about that, about the ownership of a joke and plagiarism in in this new technological age. Anyway, I'll catch you soon.